Thank you, Chairman Bryan, members, members of the public. Uh, what I'd like to do is walk through with you the uh, first, the, the conference report or the education, uh, proposed education component of the uh, House Budget Conference Report. Uh, a little bit of a different format this year, uh, so it may look a little bit unfamiliar to you, so I'll quickly walk you through that. Uh, on page F1 of, of your conference report, it should look like so. Um, so what you see here, uh, we have this kind of presentation for all three sections to try to give members a little more information about uh, what you'll be considering today and, and throughout the budget process. You'll see here both requirements and receipts in addition to the net appropriation that typically you have, uh, you'll, you'll track throughout the, uh, the conference report. So, you know, in shorthand, real quick summary, requirements are all of the funds needed to uh, support the programs that the budget would authorize. The receipts are basically non-general funds or, or non-appropriation sources, things like federal funds, things like uh, lottery, uh, user fees, that sort of thing would go into receipts. The net of that, so requirements minus receipts, gives you a net appropriation. So what is currently proposed, and as Representative Bryan pointed out, for all three sections, you won't see any anything relative to compensation yet. That's a full chair's item that will be more fully fleshed out next week. But you see a current net appropriation uh, from the revised budget here of 84323450005. So that's the amount uh, after receipts uh, that is required for appropriation. To, meet those requirements of the program. So CFTE is proposed to remain unchanged. Then on page F2, I know this isn't in the, the largest font and may just serve as a resource for you to, to look at as the day goes on or, or in the weeks ahead. Uh, what we've done here and in, in for also community colleges and University of North Carolina is to provide for you fund level detail of the enacted budget. So what's currently on the books then the proposed legislative changes, those would be in the middle columns to both requirements and receipts at a fund code level counting. And then lastly, the revised budget. So taking that enacted budget, the fund code level changes that are proposed, uh, what it would look like at a fund code level, and then adding them up to those, all those up at the bottom, uh, desire to give members and the public more information about uh, what exactly is in, in the budget. You know, as we do the budget, it's a change document. So oftentimes it can be difficult just to look at the items themselves and know exactly the totality of the budget. So we are trying to work uh, extra hard this year to make sure you have that fuller picture. Uh, the last item uh, towards that end on page F3, you see an FTE chart. There are no actual FTE adjustments proposed by the chairs. You recall public school employees are hired at the local level. So really when we talk about uh, FTE in the context of the public schools budget, that's always uh, basically folks that work with the Department of Public Construction. Uh, so there are changes in this budget, but uh, those are for locally, uh, for local employees. So with that, uh, launch into the traditional uh, item summary that we have for you starting on page F4. First item, average daily membership adjustment. So this adjustment of about 46.8 million, same as uh, the governor proposed to meet the the needs uh, for all the public schools allotments that need to be adjusted based on a net ADM increase this year of uh, 5,875 in all public schools. Uh, as you can see, the total allotted ADM for this year is 1.54 million uh, students across the state. Item number two, non-instructional support personnel. You may recall from last year's budget that General Assembly made a choice to modify uh, one of the, the major I guess uh, the programs that receive lottery receipts, uh, no longer putting those receipts in the classroom teachers and into teacher uh, assistants. Instead, those receipts have been budgeted in non-instructional support. What this item does here is to further budget an additional 57.3 million in projected lottery receipts into non-instructional support. The requirements are not reduced for the program. So there's a net uh, appropriation decrease of the same amount, 57.3 million sort of a, a technical way to say, essentially this program is moving to full funding from the lottery. There's no cut or reduction made to non-instructional support personnel, uh, but this is a fund shift. So those are our two technical adjustments the chairs are proposing within the, this uh, public schools package. Turning to item number three, uh, the start of some public school funding adjustments. 
see a, an item here for literacy coaches to support Read to Achieve. Uh, so funds in here would support uh, the hiring of uh, literacy coaches to uh, provide intensive literacy training and aid to the personnel on the ground uh, in the 20% lowest performing elementary schools throughout the state. This, like many of the other items I'll be talking to you about, the public schools budget has a corresponding provision, but I'll give you a little more detail. So, anyway, in, in totality, there are 25 million in new funding for literacy coaches. Uh, item number four, elimination of additional first grade teaching positions. So you may recall there was an item uh, that was passed in the General Assembly's uh, long session budget last year to establish additional first grade teaching positions. Those positions were not to go into effect until fiscal year 2016-17. Uh, so what the chairs are recommending is to forego those positions that have not yet been put in place. Uh, it's a reduction of about $27 million from the budget that you already passed. Uh, however, it's important to note that these positions have not actually been allocated yet to districts. Uh, so this is sort of a prospective reduction, only the second year of the budget for something that has not happened yet. Item number five, read to achieve first and second grade reading camps. Uh, again, a 2015 budget item or budget edition. Uh, you may recall that read to achieve has had a third grade reading camp component ever since its origination. Last year, the General Assembly voted to uh, expand the reading camps to first and second grade at a cost of $20 million uh, on a recurring basis. What this item would do is to change the status of that funding from recurring to non-recurring. And secondly, reduce the funding by 50%. So instead of the $20 million recurring built into the second year of the budget for the first and second grade reading camps, instead we have a $10 million non-recurring amount recommended by the chairs. Item number six, advanced placement and international baccalaureate teacher bonuses, uh, amount of 4.3 million recurring is proposed. Uh, you may recall this from the 2015 House Pass budget. Uh, this item would uh, provide the funding, again, we'll have a, a special provision to go along with this, to support a $50 bonus payment to teachers of record for students getting a successful grade on either an advanced placement or an international baccalaureate test. Similarly, moving into item seven, uh, again, something that was in your house budget last year, CTE teacher bonuses, uh, similar concept, uh, bonuses would be paid to teachers of record for students who have a successful completion of an industry certification or credential test. Uh, and there's a special provision that would go, goes into a little more detail about how those bonus payments would be derived uh, or established. Item number eight, uh, this is an item that Representative Stan brought to your attention last week during your Thursday meeting, salary supplement for national board certified instructional coaches. As you may recall from Representative Stan's explanation, currently instructional coaches in Title I schools in North Carolina, so that is the, sort of the, one of the federal proxy definitions of uh, lower income schools, that uh, coaches in those schools would, are currently allowed or authorized in statute to get a 12% salary supplement. However, instructional coaches in North Carolina that are not in Title I schools are not allowed to receive that 12% supplement. So this is the funding to reinstate the supplement uh, for instructional co all instructional coaches. There's also a corresponding provision that uh, makes the statutory, statutory change needed to affect that policy. Item number nine, instructional supplies. Uh, Cheers are recommending $5 million non-recurring increase to this allotment. As you can see, uh, the revised appropriation for instructional supplies would be $49.5 million. Turning to page F6, AP, Summer Professional Development Institute, so again, it's another item that was in your 2015 House Pass budget. This would provide support to the uh, North Carolina AP partnership to pay for at least one teacher from every LEA to participate in the Summer Professional Development Institutes. So this, this funding combined with the existing AP partnership funding would put total investment in the AP partnership at 1.6 million. Item number 11, digital learning plan. Uh, this, this item also has a corresponding special provision. Uh, this would provide 9.4 million for a variety of activities that support the state's digital learning plan for public schools. Some of those activities are spelled out here in the item description, including plan management, school and district leadership development, teacher professional development for digital, mobile device management, and digital literacy skills evaluation. Uh, this would be, again, a $9.4 million non-recurring item. I think as uh, 
some of the chairs might view it a companion piece for item number 12 and part of the digital learning plan uh, uh, fiscal ask earlier this year when it was published was additional funds for textbooks and digital materials. So as you're well aware, uh, there's already an uh, existing state allotment for textbooks and digital materials. So, uh, and in fact, you had put in the second year of your budget about a $10 million additional increase for textbooks. So the chairs are proposing to, to go further with that increase, add an additional about $11.7 million to it, such that the 2006-16-17 textbook funding level would be $73.2 million under their plan. Item 13, Cooperative and Innovative High Schools. Uh, as with last year's budget, uh, many but not all of the schools that had requested Cooperative and Innovative High School allotment funding, that is the $316,000 allotment that is uh, provided to many of the uh, cooperative and innovative high schools through the DPI budget. Uh, many of those have been supported here, eight of the 13 that are requested. Uh, there's a companion provision to address the other five schools to allow them to participate as cooperative and innovative high schools, to generate FTE at their higher education partners, uh, but those other five schools that I'll get to later will not receive the $316,000 allotment. Item number 14 uh, is proposed in the governor's budget or governor's proposed budget, a uh, $2 million reduction to the transportation allotment is included here, uh, solely based on fuel prices. So as you can see in the item description, would take the budgeted price per gallon for fuel that's funded out of the transportation allotment from 217 a gallon to 209. Uh, again, it's consistent with the, uh, the governor's request. Similarly, item number 15, panic alarms. Uh, this item was also requested in the governor's budget, so you may be familiar with it. Uh, a couple of years ago, you authorized uh, some fun recurring funding for LEAs to apply for uh, and ultimately to use to install panic alarms. Uh, that, that is about ready to phase out, so $100,000 is uh, provided on a non-recurring basis in this item to complete the phase out of the panic alarms, but uh, the recurring funding would be eliminated uh, on a going forward basis. Turning to page F7 teacher compensation models and advanced teaching roles. Uh, so this item would create a new three-year pilot program, again, with a companion provision that we'll bring to your attention later. Uh, it's a $1.1 million item, most of which is provided on a recurring basis to support LEA efforts to create uh, an organizational structure and innovative compensation methods for teachers to take on advanced teaching roles in, in your LEAs and to get compensated accordingly. Moving to uh, grant section, there are several items here that would be provided through the DPI budget to outside entities. The first of which would be distinguished leadership and practice. This was an item that was in 2015 House Pass budget, uh, provides $600,000 for the DLP program on a non-recurring basis. Uh, that program's uh, administered through the NCPAPA Principals and Assistant Principals uh, Association. Uh, so that, would, that again would get $600,000 in non-recurring support. Item number 18, Triangle Literacy Council. For some of you in the uh, uh, Joint Le uh, Legislative uh, Education Oversight Committee, you heard a presentation potentially from the council earlier this year explaining what they do. Uh, their efforts focus on serving court involved or otherwise at-risk youth. The funds proposed by the chairs here, the 690000 would support uh, establishment of additional juvenile literacy centers through the council. Item number 19, National Academy Foundation. Uh, received a presentation from this organization last week uh, in your public comment section of Thursday meeting, uh, where they requested $306,000 for expansion of up to 20 career academies across North Carolina. Uh, the chairs uh, are recommending providing that on a non-recurring basis, the full 306. Similarly, item number 20, Muddy Sneakers, uh, also came to present to you, if you recall, uh, a lot of their work is based on experiential learning and science, uh, specifically targeting fifth graders and doing a lot of hands-on field work with them. $500,000 non-recurring is recommended for the, or is provided within this proposal for Muddy Sneakers. Item 21, Teach for America. So this item is, uh, does not change the net appropriation for Teach for America which would remain to be $6 million. However, it does change the uh, nature of the funding for T TFA from recurring to non-recurring. Similarly, as we move to page F8 and the last item in the uh, conference report for, the, for public schools, communities and schools have similarly moved, their funding moved from a recurring to a non-recurring status. 
So the net appropriation in 16, 17 for communities and schools still remains 2.4 million. No reduction on that, uh, but the status of the funding would be changed from recurring to non-recurring. So with that, Mr. Chair, and a little bit of breath on my part, we move into provisions, Mr. Chair. Uh, the next document I endeavor, endeavor to walk you through you is the proposed special provisions, so the, the text-laden document. I'll try to go through these at a, at a high level, and certainly if there are more detailed questions, I'm happy to take those after or even farm those out to my far better educated colleagues on the right. Page one, funds for children with disabilities. This is some boilerplate language you see in every education budget that adjusts the dollars per pupil uh, provided for uh, identified students with disabilities. You can see that amount there. Uh, and this is boilerplate and, and something you get every year. Same for item number two, funds for academically gifted children. See an updating here of the 2016-17 funds per child. Item number three, litigation reserve. Uh, this, this provision uh, provides the State Board of Ed the authority to spend up to $500,000 in unexpended uh, funds that you provide through the State Public School Fund for certified teachers. But if those funds were to go unexpended and the State Board uh, wish to use them for, for litigation related purposes that it could. Page F4, small county supplemental funds eligibility. We characterize this as a, a technical amendment here. What this one endeavors to do is, uh, you may recall for district eligibility in the small county supplemental funding allotment, districts need to be 3,200 or fewer ADM to qualify. Uh, or this is county districts, not cities. So in a scenario in which a district had been adjudged or projected to have more, more than 3,200 students, uh, potentially their eligibility could be called into question for this allotment, even if, in fact, they had fewer than 3,200 students show up during the school year. So what this language does is allow DPI to take a look back to uh, the actual first, first or second month uh, information this year or the prior year in order to be able to make the determination on small county eligibility. Turning to page five, uh, driver's education program funds. Uh, so my colleagues who, uh, on the transportation team who were out with members earlier today uh, had a provision that, that went along with it. this one. What this provision does is to uh, repeal the projected repeal of the driver's ed program uh, that was would happen without this provision on December 31st, 2017. So uh, that had been written into last year's budget in the education section of the budget. In the transportation side, the fee that is being used starting in 2016 to fund driver's ed on a going forward basis, that also had a sunset that is uh, proposed to be repealed in the transportation section of the house's budget. Page six, literacy coaches in low performing elementary schools. So as mentioned earlier, this is one of several provisions that uh, goes along with a money item. Uh, the high level review on this is that the state, state board of ed Will, uh, is directed by this provision to allocate funds for literacy coach positions based on the 20% lowest performing elementary schools in the state. Provision additionally requires the State Board of Ed to establish rules for the qualification of literacy coaches and also limits the transfer of literacy coach funding for other purposes. So you do have a few of those requirements already in statute where funds may not be transferred out of one allotment to another. Uh, the statute would uh, make literacy coach funding non-transferable to other purposes. Turning to page eight, teacher compensation models and advanced teaching roles. Again, another provision that goes with the money item. This provision directs the State Board of Ed to establish a three-year pilot program to develop the advanced teaching roles and to provide supplemental compensation for teachers in those roles. Uh, State Board, if this passes, I have a, a busy next several months with it by September 15th. State Board shall issue an RFP for LEAs to participate in the pilot, so soliciting LEA participation. LEAs have a window to respond back, and then by December 15th of the calendar year, State Board shall select up to 10 LEAs to participate with full implementation beginning in school year 2017-18. Uh, lastly, up to $200,000 within uh, the funds provided can be used for evaluation of the compensation models and advance rules. Turning next to page 12, AP and IP bonuses. Uh, this follows the provision and is uh, essentially identical to what the House passed last year. 
see a bonus of fifty dollars uh, to be awarded to teachers of record for uh, students uh, getting a three or higher on an AP course or a grade of four or higher on an AP, uh, sorry, on an IB test, and puts a maximum of two thousand dollars for cumulative bonuses for any teacher in the state. So, may earn up to two thousand from this end of this program. Turning to page thirteen. Uh, for the industry certifications and credential bonuses, again, this goes with the money item I described to you earlier. Uh, the Department of Commerce shall work with the State Board of Ed under this provision to determine two different classifications of industry certifications. One of those would yield a $25 bonus for a teacher of record for a successful, for every successful uh, uh, certification completion done by a student in their classes. Additionally, there would be another tier of certifications that would yield the $50 bonus. State Board of Ed would work with uh, Commerce every year uh, in order to establish those bonus values. Turning to page 15, National Board Supplement for All Instructional Coaches. As mentioned before, this is the statutory language required to allow for the money item restoring uh, a 12% salary supplement for all instructional coaches, not just those in Title I schools. Page 16 the operation of certain cooperative and innovative high schools without additional funds. Uh, what this provision does, it allows Cabarrus Early College of Technology, Johnson County Career and Tech Academy, Stanley County School of Engineering and Design, and uh, City of Medicine Cooperative and Innovative High School, as well as Hillside New Tech Cooperative and Innovative High School, allows all five to operate as a CIHS, generate FTE for their higher education partner. Page 17, uh, report for schools for students with visual and hearing impairments and foreign exchange students. There are two major components to this provision. The first is a requirement that LA, LEA superintendent shall report annually information on hearing impaired or visually impaired children and, and essentially family information there uh, to the three residential schools in the state for uh, blind and deaf students. So the LEAs will provide that information on an annual basis under this provision. Secondly, the bottom half here, uh, under uh, that would modify 115C-150.14, uh, it would permit a foreign exchange student to attend a residential school at the full unsubsidized cost of providing education at the school. So to the extent that an eligible foreign exchange student and their family wanted to enroll the student and have them provided services at the residential schools, uh, they would be permitted to do so provided they paid the full cost of, of those services. Turning to page 18, virtual charter school changes. Uh, there are a few different things going on here. The first is clarification of how test administration is to take place for VCS students. Uh, so now newly allowed would be testing multiple grade levels at the same uh, time and place. There's some detail here about uh, what the characteristics of a test administrator could be. Uh, at the, for, for the purposes of uh, administering virtual charter schools or VCS tests. Moving down towards the bottom of the provision, uh, there's uh, uh, several changes to the section dealing with the withdrawal rate allowed for the VCSs relative to students that initially enroll. This provision would increase the allowable withdrawal rate from 25 to 35%, as well as omitting certain classifications of students from the rate calculation. So, there would be certain classifications not counted as part of that ultimate percentage, uh, as well as the percentage going from 25 to 35. Turning to page 20, nationally recognized college entrance tests or exams, pardon me. This provision requires the State Board of Ed to use a bid process to adopt two or more nationally recognized college entrance exams to be made available to LEAs, as opposed to the existing requirement, which is solely for the ACT. Then under this provision, LEAs would select one exam from those made available by the State Board of Ed to be used in the LEA's respective district. Uh, so the LEA would make the choice ultimately from a menu of uh, nationally recognized college entrance exams. Turning to page 22, school business system modernization. Uh, so this provision would direct the State Board of Ed in collaboration with the Friday Institute at NC State develop a modernization plan for the systems used by DPI's Financial and Business Services Division to manage and deliver funds and technical support services to both the LEAs and charter schools. 
the State Board would report back to Joint uh, Ed Oversight by April 30, 2017 on the plan and any potential costing for upgrade of their existing systems. Moving to page 23, International Exchange Teacher Funds. Uh, in this provision, there's some clarification about the allowable uses uh, by, the, by the school districts of funds uh, that are, are you know, essentially, the, there's current statutory authorization that classroom teacher funds may be converted at the average salary in order to hire uh, what are known as VIF, or visiting international faculty teachers. Uh, so their conversion can be made to hire those teachers using dollars from the converted positions. This specifies with a little bit more detail what types of expenditures can be made once those funds are converted. Uh, you see a list there in the underlying sections of the provision. Page 24, K-12 cybersecurity study. So this would be a requirement for DPI to study cybersecurity issues in all North Carolina public schools, both LEAs and charters. Report back findings to you all by December 15th of the calendar year. Page 25, North Carolina virtual public schools revenues. Uh, it's an item that was included in your 2015 House Pass budget, which would provide an exemption to the Umstead Act for uh, the North Carolina virtual public schools to uh, be able to uh, essentially sell some of their services publicly. Moving next to uh, page 26, this provision modifies school performance grades, does two main things. The first would be to modify the existing school achievement score calculation from 80% based on performance and 20% based on growth to an equal 50% based on performance and 50% based on growth. Additionally, this would codify the use of a 15-point scale rather than a 10-point scale for school grades. So as you can see, as you move down to uh, lines 13 through 22, uh, school performance score of at least 85 would be equivalent to an A, 70 equivalent to a B, so on and so forth with the 15-point scale. Turning to page Turning to page 27, joint legislative study on cooperative individual high schools. Heard a lot the last few years in your committee about uh, what's happening with the cooperative innovative schools. Uh, what this joint study committee would do, be populated by three members of the House, three members of the Senate, and take a targeted look at the policy goals of the cooperative innovative program, its alignment with the existing statute. As you might recall, this program came out of a lot of antecedent uh, programs like Huskins and, and Learn and Earn. So, kind of taking a look back at the statute, see if it reflects the General Assembly's current policy goals for these schools. And secondly, looking at the current funding model for cooperative innovative schools and ensuring the financial sustainability of the pro program going forward. I think we're getting close to the end here in public schools. Thanks for bearing with me. Page 28, pilot program to raise the high school dropout age from 16 to 18. This would authorize another five-year pilot for Hickory and Newton Conover City who had been on a two-year pilot basis. Uh, school districts would also have to uh, opt in to this program, so this just gives the authority. Uh, a third entity, Rutherford County Schools, is added to this authority. Uh, they have not previously uh, been in a dropout pilot uh, program, but again, for all three of these, Hickory, Newton Conover City, and Rutherford County Schools, uh, they could, at their own discretion, uh, have, participate in the pilot program to raise the dropout age in their systems from 16 to 18. Moving to page 30, reading assessments, uh, read to achieve. What this provision does is modifies the existing RTA language, read to achieve language to require the State Board of Ed to approve three valid, reliable, formative, and diagnostic reading assessment instruments for the LEAs to choose from, or from which they can choose, beginning in uh, school year 2017-18. So basically expanding the number of instruments that would be available for LEAs to choose from. Page 31, Digital Learning Plan Funds. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a, a money item for the Digital Learning Plan. This just fleshes out a little bit more uh, what some of the uh, activities are to be, to be done with the, the nine plus million that was provided for uh, the DLP. The highlights here include uh, coordination of uh, implementing professional learning programs, support teachers and school administrators, essentially uh, hopefully high quality professional development and digital for teachers and administrators. Uh, management of statewide cooperative purchasing for content uh, and provision of shared resources to teachers. Uh, 
also the creation of assessments for technological and pedagogical skills and best practices. So with that, I think we have finally reached the end of the public schools related items.